This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to, the, to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. <laughs> they are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. But this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the, the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, wander over to Hobby Lobby. Not today, they're closed. You know that find it emblazoned on all kinds of plaques and, and wooden signs and metal artwork and everything else, or check out Christian graduation cards. You'll see it on many of them. For Jeremiah 29 verse 11 has become a kind of mantra for folks who are facing new chapters in their lives, going off to college, starting new careers. It's popular because it's, it's just so hopeful, isn't it? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Everybody needs that, whether they know it or not, even if it's not realistic. I think of a man many years ago who was sentenced to death. He obtained a reprieve by assuring the king he would teach his majesty's horse how to fly within a year on the condition that if he didn't succeed, he would then be put to death at the end of the year. The king agreed. When a friend asked him how in the world he was going to do that, the man simply answered, well, within a year, the king may die, <laughs> or I may die, or the horse may die, or who knows, maybe the horse will learn to fly. Alexander Pope was right, wasn't he? Hope does spring eternal in the human breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. That's why some people buy lottery tickets and they keep on buying. Or they go to Texans football games. <laughs> we all want to think things are going to get better, don't we? Only sometimes they don't. Sometimes life surprises us. Think of a woman named Trudy Rosenfield. She left her native England one day to fly to sunny San Jose, California. Only a travel agent made an error when she booked the flight. She accidentally put the 70-year-old woman on a flight to San Jose, Costa Rica. Mrs. Rosenfeld fell asleep on the plane, blissfully unaware she was headed 3,000 miles to, in a different direction. 
And when she, and when she never arrived at the California airport, her cousin who was waiting for her there called the airline. They quickly figured out what had happened. They sent an agent to meet her plane. So imagine her surprise when she woke up, got off the plane and was greeted at the gate with, ma'am, you think you are in California, but actually you're in Costa Rica. And that wasn't necessarily a bad exchange. Costa Rica for California? But it's a reflection of how sometimes life throws us a curveball, doesn't it? We think we've met the person of our dreams. They turn out to be a nightmare. We get the job we just knew we wanted. And the first day we think, oh, this is not going to work. We plan a beautiful retirement together. And then our spouse becomes ill or disabled or, or worse, or they die. Or a child or a grandchild who seems perfectly healthy is suddenly diagnosed with a life-changing illness. Sometimes all of our carefully constructed plans fall apart. We plan for California, we end up in Costa Rica. Only for the people of Jeremiah's day, it, it was far worse than that. For the people of Judah found themselves neither in California nor Costa Rica, but by the rivers of Babylon. You may remember the story. The Assyrians had already conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, dispersing those ten tribes like the wind across the sands of the Middle East. The southern kingdom of Judah had held on another century and a half or so by managing to find some middle ground, quite literally, between Egypt to their south and, and the empires of Assyria and then Babylon to their north. But it wasn't easy when their best king, Josiah, died in 609 B.C., 31 years after, after ascending to the throne at the age of eight, the kingdom lurched from one incompetent bad leader to another. First to his son, Jehoahaz, he only lasted three months. Then to another son, Jehoiakim, and the Egyptians more or less put on the throne until the geopolitics of the region began to shift and Babylon, under its new leader, Nebuchadnezzar, began to gobble up all the neighboring nations. Jehoiakim at first paid tribute to those Babylonians, but then he waffled and tried to revolt against them. They came to Jerusalem with a vengeance. Jehoiakim died with his enemies at his gates. 598 B.C. His son, Jehoiah Chin, this sounds almost as bad as keeping up with the Kims in, in the Koreas, isn't it? Let's just call him Chinny. Chinny only lasted three months on the throne before he was hauled off to Babylon with thousands of other Nebuchadnezzar then appointed Chinny's uncle another son of Josiah, as the new king changed his name to Zedekiah, went back east. Until Zedekiah, that is, likewise tried to rebel, he caused the Babylonian armies to come back to Jerusalem in 587 B.C., and this time they burned the place down, destroyed the city walls, looted the temple, captured Zedekiah, blinded him, then hauled him back 500 miles to Babylon. Between those two invasions, the prophet Jeremiah, who had remained in Jerusalem after the first Babylonian siege, wrote a letter, a sephir, a, a missive to his countrymen who had already been deported 500 miles to Babylon. Only if the truth be known, Jeremiah was probably the last person they wanted to hear from. <laughs> Jeremiah who had been called as a prophet when Josiah was still king, probably just a teenager at the time. He was not a popular man 
at all. We don't know a whole lot about him. Only that he came from a priestly family who lived north of Jerusalem in a little town called Anathoth. But even his family was skeptical of Jeremiah. Some of them hated him. Some of them conspired against him. Anybody here know a family like that? He was a consistent gadfly, both to the religious and the political establishment of his time. He called out injustices. He called out hypocrisies. He called the hated Nebuchadnezzar a servant of the Lord. A servant of the Lord. He was forbidden to preach in the temple complex. He was thrown into a cistern for a while. He was more than once in prison and beaten before he was finally carted off to Egypt against his will. But the hardest thing was that the court prophets of Zedekiah, the ones who said what the king wanted to hear, people like Hananiah, told everybody else the Atzal was just a bump in the road. Those folks would be coming back to Jerusalem any day now. What's more, Hananiah communicated to the false prophets who were with the Atzals in Babylon. And so they were telling those Atzals and Babylon the same thing. Two years here, tops, two years. All of which led Jeremiah to send this letter to the surviving Atzals. The Hebrew just says the old men. <laughs> with a message that was completely the opposite of what they had been hearing. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those who I, do you get that? Not Nebuchadnezzar, not the Babylonians, God himself, all those who I carried, uncovered, removed from Jerusalem to Babylon, Build houses, live in them. Plant gardens, gana, orchards like, like, the, like the garden or the gone that, that God had planted in Eden. Eat what they produce. That meant they're going to be in Babylon for at least a few growing seasons. <laughs> Marry and have sons and daughters, banim, banoth, bin, and bath. Then find wives and husbands for those kids so they can have sons and daughters, more bin, more banoth means we're up to the third generation now. In other words, settle down and grow not just some crops in the garden, but there by the rivers of Babylon grow families as well. And then get this, Jeremiah says, seek the peace and prosperity. It's just one word in the Hebrew, the word shalom, the welfare. See, the peace and prosperity, the shalom of the city to which I've carried you. Pray to the Lord for it because in its shalom, in its welfare, you will find your own shalom, your own welfare. That's a pretty amazing notion, isn't it? Pray for your conquerors. Pray for the ones who hold you halfway across the fertile crescent to live in a land that is not your own. And yet there's something rather powerful about that notion. We've made that verse, Jeremiah 29, verse 7, in fact, our theme for the past few years here at Christ Church. Though we are hardly living in exile here in, here in First Colony, unless perhaps you've been driven out of River Oats for some reason. We're all still kind of exiles in our culture, aren't we? Increasingly, those who follow Christ are more and more out of sync with our society. In the words of Hebrews eleven thirteen, we are foreigners and strangers on earth, looking for a country of our own. But wherever God has put us, He's also called us to dig in and make a difference, to do good 
as one translation puts it. That's why we're involved in community ministries here as a church. We're active in the middle school across the street. Uh, we visit in the elementary schools all around here. Some of you tutor kids there or you just care for them. We're in the prisons nearby with many of you going to teach Bible studies and counsel with the brothers in white every week. We send out Meals on Wheels every single weekday from our Austin Parkway door downstairs. We support the Dream League at the, on the baseball fields just across the parking lot. We offer shelter when it rains with people sleeping right here in these pews. And we always tell them, don't worry, you aren't the first people to sleep in these pews. <laughs> this afternoon at 2 o'clock in Richmond, we'll dedicate our 16th Habitat for Humanity home. You should go over there if you want to be inspired. We take this word from Jeremiah seriously, you see. In fact, we've literally planted a garden out behind the Family Life Center, providing an incredible amount of produce to the food programs around us. And sure enough, in seeking the shalom, the peace, the welfare of those all around us, I believe God is bringing us shalom as well. That's what Jeremiah, one of those exiles in Babylon, to understand. If you can't go to California, make the best of Costa Rica. You see, even though it wasn't home, Jeremiah wanted them to know God was there anyway. And their exile in Babylon would come to an end. Ironically, 70 wasn't just the number of years of the exile. 70 was also the length of the Babylonian Empire, the greatest and most powerful the world had ever known at the time. Lasted for 70 years. And Jeremiah wanted them to hear that God had plans for them. That's a great word in Hebrew, by the way. Makashaba. Makashaba. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, God has some makashaba for you. <laughs> Yeah. Makashaba means thoughts, as in Genesis 6, 5, where we read that God knew every inclination of the thoughts, the makashaba of the human heart. It means designs, uh, as in Exodus 35, 32, Moses told the Israelites God had given some individuals the skill to make artistic designs, makashaba, for what was needed in the sanctuary. Some of you have those skills too. It means wonders, the things God had planned for us. The Makashaba in Psalm 40, verse 5. It means we are in God's thoughts and prayers, so to speak. And despite what some will tell you, that is no small thing today, if you take it seriously. But when it's God, well, Isaiah told us, God's thoughts are immeasurably higher than ours. Higher than the heavens or the earth. Our minds, even when they were firing at full capacity, move out upon the outskirts of the glorious realm of the infinite and eternal thought of God. And what is it that God has planned for you? What is it God has planned for me? What is it God has planned for us? It is nothing less than to give us a future. That's the after part, the expected end, and a hope. We've been talking about hope for the past four weeks. Uh, maybe it's time we define it one further way. For the Hebrew term here in Jeremiah 29 is the word tikva. Tikva. What it literally means is a cord or a rope. Sometimes a scarlet one. You say, uh, but what does a scarlet cord have to do with hope? Ask a woman named Rahab when you meet her in heaven one day. Or if you don't want to wait until then, just go back and read Joshua 2. There you will see Rahab, who was a prostitute in Jericho, was led to protect Joshua and the Israelite spies who had come into her city before the conquest. And when they left 
her home, which was built into the city walls, let down by a rope through a window. They told her, now you tie a scarlet rope in, your, in this window. Leave it up as a sign. When they came back, this time with the Israelite army, when the Israelites saw that rope, that shoot, that tikva, they spurred everyone in that house. The cord was a sign of protection. The cord was a sign of hope. That's what God promised to the exiles in Babylon too. A cord, a tikva, a cord, a sign of hope. A lifeline, if you will. That's what God has promised you and me this morning too. See, I doubt very much that any of those high school graduates who get a nice little card with Jeremiah 29, verse 11 printed on it will think of the context of those words, especially if that nice little card has a nice little, little check or some cash in it too. But here's the amazing thing about it. Our hope is not tied to our present circumstances at all. Our future is not limited by our present or even by our past. Our relief may not be immediate. We may have a season of struggle to, that we simply have to go through to get to the other side. As someone once said, when you're going through hell, keep going. But as G.K. Chesterton long ago wrote, hope means hoping when things are hopeless or it is no virtue at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, hope is mere flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. This morning, I don't know what season of life you're in. But I suspect that for more than a few of us, there are some significant obstacles in our pathway. There are some burdens we're still bearing. There are some sins we're still struggling against. There are some infirmities we haven't been able to, 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 to overcome. Listen again to what God said through that old curmudgeonly prophet, Jeremiah. I got plans for you. <laughs> Big plans. And they're good ones. Call on me and I will listen to you. Seek me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you. And one day, at the exact and perfect and right moment, I will bring you home. Who knows? Maybe that horse will learn to fly. Amen.